All right. Well, we covered a lot of history last time, um, and you may wonder why didn't you talk about the books of Kings and Chronicles, like their their outline and whatnot. Well, the reason why is because I'm going to cover them uh, in the order of when they were written. But in order to do that, I wanted to give you the chronology of events, and then we'd come back and talk about the actual books itself. Okay? Um, so. so that takes us to the Song of Solomon, and I have had, I have posted a video about this a long time ago. Um, so, it, I mean, I don't know if I say everything that I did in there. It's been a long time since I recorded that, but um, hopefully you'll be able to look that up. Uh, if you have any any further questions, or once again, you can ask me, and I'll and I'll post a reply. So it's called the Song of Song, which is Solomon's. Basically, the idea there is it's the best song, you know, um, a, a very um, the, the song of songs, you know, the 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 best song. Basically, that that's, I mean, I hope you understand what I'm saying, I, but I can't think of another way to say it. Um, so. The, the the key aspect of Song of Solomon is human sexuality. You know, a lot of times in the church, because people misuse sexual sexuality, the church sometimes goes to uh, to the extremes on the other side, so as to not even closely associate with them. But the thing is, is I mean, even like a generation or two ago, sex and and, and marriage was only for procreation, no other reason. Well, I mean, that's a little silly. Um, Song of Solomon shows us that human sexuality is okay between spouses, um, and, and that that's pleasurable. It can be pleasurable. That that it is something that that is is good, is fun. Um, and but obviously there's more than just sex. Obviously there's more than just sex. But it, you know obviously sex is a large part of intimacy. Um, it was either written or commissioned by Solomon around 950s or so. Um, it, it, now, I do want to bring something up. Sometimes it's said, oh, well, marriage is an imagery, it is popular imagery or allegory towards um, 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 uh, towards God and his people. Yes, it is. However, just because something is commonly used as allegory does not mean that it always is allegory. So, um, in 1, 6 through 8, and 2, 1, we see the woman is very insecure. Um, 1, 6 through 8 says, um, Do not stare at me because I'm swarthy, for the sun has burned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me caretakers of the vineyards. You can see how, how, how insecure she is with herself. And then in 2, 1, she picks up with, I'm the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. Remember, remember that old Christian song? He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright of morning star. It's that's not even talking about about the man, anyways. Even if this is an allegory, it's still not talking about the man. It's talking about the woman, the way that she doesn't see herself as attractive. So she says, "I'm just a rose of Sharon. I'm a weed. I'm a lily of the valleys. There's a hundred like me. I mean, I'm, I'm nothing special. I'm nothing unique." And and the man picks up in the next verse, "Like a lily among thorns, so is my darling among the maidens." See, he uses her insecurity to affirm her. And to give her security, rather than saying, "Oh no, you shouldn't be thinking like that. You you should be thinking like this." Rather than saying that kind of nonsense, he uses that insecurity. You call yourself you call yourself a weed, but like a lily among the thorns, I say you are. See, and it's just very very um, very passionate wording there. Um, now remember, this is this is of course um, uh, poetry. So it's going to say things in indirect ways, and just because you don't know what a certain um, poetical phrase means, does not mean you should just make it up and, and just apply something that you want willy nilly. So in, in five, in chapter five, verse one, it seems like it is God who's the one uh, uh, approving of the love. See, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh along with my balsam. I have eaten my honeycomb and my hun honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Eat friends, drink and imbibe deeply, O oh lovers. So he's all talking, and it seems like it just kind of breaks suit. And it seems uh, uh, comment, some commentators, uh, usually more conservative ones, but have made the have made the comment that it's it's God interjecting at this point and saying, you know, that he drink deeply, O oh lovers. Um, so. Um, another thing we have coming up later is the wife becomes indifferent and the husband becomes absent. In 5.2, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. 
um, you know, and obviously, I already mentioned about the, um, I already mentioned about, uh, um, about that. So the husband, okay, yeah, the husband is nowhere to be found, and the wife, I mean, he all comes knocking at the door, and she's just like, um, you know, this, uh, uh, this is not not a good time, um, and so it's just kind of funny how how you know that happens to us in, in real life too. I mean, that's something that we all struggle with. In a five two three, you see that. Um, And he picks up in nine, what kind of beloved is your beloved, O oh, most beloved, a beautiful among women? What kind of beloved is your beloved that thus you adjure us? My beloved is dazzling and ruddy, outstanding among ten thousand. So the woman find, finds her reconciliation in, uh, in in thinking about about the man. And then in chapter six, it eventually picks up. Who is this that grows like the dawn, as beautiful as a, sun, as a full sun, as pure as a sun, as awesome as an army with banners? I went down to the orchard of nut trees to see the blossoms of the valley, to see whether the vine had budded or the pomegranate had bloomed. Before I was aware, my soul set me over the chariots of my noble people. Come back, come back, O Shulamite. Come back, come back, that we may gaze at you. Why should you gaze at the Shulamite as at the face of the two com companion, um, companies? Um... And then uh, he picks up, How beautiful are your feet and sandals, O princess daughter, and prince's daughter? Uh, the curve of your hips are like jewels, the work of the hands of an artist. So see, when she, when she, um, when she, um, focuses her attention, I guess you'd say, back on, on him, I mean, it is interesting that, that it shows him back again, praising her. Um, you know, I don't know if there's anything to it, maybe I'm just reading into it, but maybe... You know, it, it is true that oftentimes, uh, even though the husband, of course, is that of the home and whatnot, that the wife definitely does, is able to, to control a lot of times, a lot of times, the tone of the house and, and bring a husband's attention back by her by her affection and by her, her um, attention. Uh, maybe I'm reading too much into that, but I mean, that is a true principle either way. Um, so the courtship in, in chapter 1 through chapter 3, verse 5, the wedding in, in verse 6 through 5, 1, uh, the, mature, the maturing of the marriage, basically. I don't know how to say that, maturation of marriage in chapter 5, verse 2 through 8, uh, verse 4. And then the nature, power, and origin of love in 8, 5 through 14. So some themes there. God created the male and female. You do see them, man and woman. It, it doesn't mention any other wives, and I think, honestly, it's a bad idea. Even if, even if it is okay to have more than one wife, I think that that's just kind of a bad idea. Uh, first off, one wife takes a lot of time and attention to really love. Two, if you have two wives, um, it is very hard, I imagine at least, it would be very hard to love them both equally. See what I mean? Um, so, um, another thing, uh, love love is good. We see that love and, and intimacy and sex, they're, they're good things, and that there's no shame in marital sex. Um, if, you are, if you are married to someone, there, you should not feel, not feel ashamed about that. That is something that you two can share together. And that does not mean that you should share that with the rest of the world, but among yourselves, you have nothing to be ashamed of. Um, in fact, and I think it's five or six. It, it talks about um, them, uh, them having, you know, consummating the marriage. I think it's the end of chapter four. I think. But anyways, um, so why should we not take this as an allegory? Um, well, first off, what did the original audience think it was? A love poem. What does it claim of itself? What does the text claim of itself? A love poem. What happens when you compare it to other writings of the time? A love poem. Uh, what does reason say? Well, reason says we don't have sex with God. If you make this an allegory, it becomes very disturbing. That Very disturbing. Um, downright inappropriate as it applies to God. So, there's that. Um, uh, what, what is the implication of, of this um, of this being a song? That sex is not wrong in marriage. What is the implication of it being an allegory? See what I mean? You can't just willy-nilly create meaning for something that has no basis historically, no basis, you know, po poetically. It just... If you, if you always try to spiritualize something, you'll miss what the Bible is actually saying. So why have people not taken this literally, historically speaking? Because they were uncomfortable with the image of sex.
they didn't see the two uh, sex and God meshing. So, um, <clears throat> Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon probably sometime once again around the 950s when he was reigning. Um, and, and it talks about the effects of sinful living. See, Solomon was, was the wisest man, and yet he didn't act wise. And so as a result, he felt like he felt in Ecclesiastes. And even though Ecclesiastes is still um, inspired by the Lord, it is still important to note that sometimes when we live in sin, when, when we do the wrong thing, when we know what's right to do, we come to this point of just hopelessness. In fact, if we don't know what the right thing is to do and we live in sin, we come to a place of hopelessness. Um, so the effects of the sinful living in chapter 1, 2. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanity is all is vanity. So you inevitably, inevitably will come to that conclusion um, when you live your own way. Um, so it says, you know, I, I did not... I, I did not take. I did not keep anything from from my mouth. I, I allowed allowed everything to be enjoyed. That's not wisdom. In fact, I wrote a, a blog about wisdom. You can click on the link below and, and find it on my um, on my Tumblr. It's just called Wisdom. Um, wisdom is about discernment and discretion too. It's it's not about just doing whatever you want whenever you want. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, so then also, uh, we see that time and, and time and death is, uh, is certain, that, that everybody has the same amount of time in a day. Nobody knows when death is going to happen, but that it will definitely happen. Um, and there is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under, the, under heaven, he says. So, uh, we also see that, that at the end of all these things that he's considered, that God gives meaning to life. Now remember, the, uh, Ecclesiastes is really about, what is my purpose in life? And if you look, he goes through all the things that people, even today, try to find purpose in life. Oh, if I have a good job, if I have money, if I have all these, I have all these different things. And he comes to the conclusion that no, it doesn't. God gives is the one who gives meaning to that life. Um, and, and, and so, once again, the second of the exceptions. Proverbs is how you should live your life. But here's, once again, the exception. Reason cannot give you purpose in life. You cannot just arrive at a purpose in life by thinking hard enough. So... Um, Ecclesiastes outlined the title and theme is chapter 1 through, through, through verse 11. Reflections on wisdom, verse 12, all the way through chapter 4, six, uh, verse 16. Uh, admonitions and observations in 5, 1 through 12, 8. And, 12, through 12, 8. and this is, there are, are, are a lot of uh, comparable things in, in, in Near, Near Eastern writings, uh, um, uh, wisdom uh, literature, um, about admonitions and whatnot. So, um, conclusions in 12, 9 through 14. Um, so we see that things do not fulfill, and we see that reason cannot give purpose. Um, I think that's kind of a kind of a big thing, big point. So we go down from 950 all the way down to 770. You know, uh, almost 200 years later, and we come to Israel um, to a man named Jonah, who is mentioned in um, I believe it's in Kings, um, and Assyria is still the the main power, even though they're in a time of decline. So Jonah is called to go to Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria. Um, and as I mentioned before, the Assyria was had previously persecuted Israel, so it, it would have been very easy for for Jonah to have had a bad attitude um, towards um, towards Nineveh. Um, we also see that uh, throughout the book of Jonah that bitterness will stop your compassion. If you allow yourself to be offended, you will not see people, and you will not see their hurt. Jonah wasn't even concerned that these, that these people were going to die. Um, and 4, 1 through 3, it says, But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I, what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, the one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. The Lord said, Do you have good reason to be angry? Now, I want to I uh, uh, approach something. Sometimes people say, well, is, is Jonah real? There is nothing in the book that, that is written like a myth, especially if you compare it to, to other writings. It's not written like that. Um, it, it involves real people. It involves um, real time, real events that happened and whatnot. I mean, it, it does. You, I mean, definitely, you could establish it as a myth, but I mean, 
you would be pretty hard pressed. But then also there's a thing that the, of God's word is given in it, um, and so. I mean, it clearly establishes him as a prophet. Jesus himself mentions him in a historical context as though he actually happened. So to say that Jonah is not real, that the, it's just a myth to, prove, to, to teach a lesson, um, is very unlikely. Very unlikely. Um, and it also, by the way, if you're a Christian, you shouldn't even try for that anyways, because once again, who are you to s decide which is right and wrong? And if you set yourself as the authority that says what is what is what actually happened and what's not didn't actually happen, then you're actually degrading the the integrity of, of the Bible message. If you don't even believe the, the message yourself, how are you gonna tell other people also? But um, you know you are you are downgrading that. Um, so, anyways, okay. We see in Jonah an image of the prophets that they were real people with real struggles. You know, um, and, and 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 they didn't always want to do where they where they, what they wanted to do. They didn't always, they weren't always called to go to places that they wanted to be. To live lives that they wanted to live, to tell messages that they wanted to give. The prophet was not someone who, who just decided one day that he was going to be the prophet. We talked about this in the introduction. A prophet was someone called by God to be his mouthpiece. Um, but also we see that if they didn't hear, they couldn't repent. And that was kind of what Jonah was leaning towards. He didn't want them to repent. 1, 1 through 3 talks about him running. And then 3, 4 uh, talks about... Um, Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. He didn't even give them a, a, a hope for the future. He just said, Hey, you're going to be destroyed. So, uh, and he went to Tarshish at the beginning here. Uh, that is in the exact opposite direction. Um, it's not even kind of sort of around. No, it's the complete opposite direction. Um, So we also see that God doesn't get joy in judgment. He doesn't get joy in, in punishing people. It's not like he wakes up in the morning and says, "Hey, I am going to kill somebody today." You know, he 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 greatly desires that they turn. And he says, "You know, Nineveh has 120,000 people plus animals, and you don't care if it gets destroyed. At least care for the animals' sake." See, because in Jonah's mind, the Ninevites were lower than animals. <laughs> they were they were worms. He hated them. You know, and so he says, well, what about even the animals, let alone the 120,000 people? So, uh, so the outline is Jonah wants his way in one in chapter 1, 1 through 16. His way in 1. Uh, Jonah decides on God's way in 1, 17 through 2, 10. Jonah preaches in, th in chapter 3. Jonah pouts in chapter 4. The main message is judgment would come to Nineveh if they did not repent. Simple summation. So that takes us to the prophet Amos. Now this was around 760. <clears throat> Excuse me. I uh, drank some water before the lesson. It really is not sitting. Uh, so, uh, Israel was in power. His audience was Israel. Um, he went from he was from Judah, but he did go to Israel. Um, he was a sheep herder, but he was also a fig grower and was called sycamore figs. Um, and says that in 7, 10 through 17. Um, and, and, and so we, we also see throughout Amos and other books that spiritual decay leads to social injustice. People are not concerned with the society when they have a spiritual problem. You know, um, In fact, that's one thing that concerns me with the American church today is um, at the time of this recording, the Charleston shooting has just happened. And there's a lot of African Americans who are, who are very upset about it. Um, and sadly, I don't think that, uh, that the... Um, the, the Caucasians, the white the white people, I don't think that they are taking this as serious as it needs to. But then you have other people who are going to other extremes, like, um, for instance, uh, the, co the, the car from that show, um, the Dukes of Hazzard, um, they're, they're, just, they're just stopping all the, uh, all the Confederate flag stuff. And here, here's the thing. Yes, the Confederate flag is a part of our history, and we need to remember that. However, we also need to be sensitive. And I, and I know a lot of people say, okay, the, the, the war was about big or small government. Yes, I know that. But in the minds of many, in, in pop culture, okay, the Confederate flag has become a symbol of slavery. Okay, so regardless of how you view it, you need to be a lot more sensitive. Okay, it's it's it's. I'm not talking about be, about not preaching the gospel. This has nothing to do with the gospel. It's a part of history that you're choosing to be stubborn about and causing fights, and you're not being a peacemaker. Jesus said to be a peacemaker. That means you go where there is no peace, and you will make peace. 
If you make a fuss about things like the Confederate flag, which don't really matter in the long run, are you making peace? No. You're affirming your rights as an American. Well, yeah, but sometimes we need to give up those rights in order to, uh, to be a better witness, and we need to be sensitive. And for a lot of people, especially the African American community at large, uh, the Confederate flag is offensive. So regardless of what you think it means, they think it means something else. It's just like the argument about tattoos. Is it right or wrong to get tattoos? If it offends somebody, just hold off. I mean, honestly, the people who are getting offended about tattoos are going to die off within the next few years anyways. Just hold off for a few years. Who knows? Maybe you don't want, uh, Maybe you're rushing into a tattoo anyways. See what I mean? Like, is it going to hurt anybody by you just holding off on a tattoo? Why hold off on a tattoo? I, I have my rights. Just to not offend. I mean, there, nothing's going to happen if you get a tattoo. Which, once again, oh, well, the Old Testament, we're not trying to make people Jewish. Okay? People don't, people don't earn their salvation through works. And we'll talk about how you understand uh, the law in, in another class that I'll upload, talking about under, understanding the Bible. Um, but for right now, just, just wind back and remember that it's we're not saved by works. So, spiritual, I, say, I said all that to come back to this. Spiritual decay leads to social injustice. We should be concerned about abortion. We, can, we should be concerned about people living together and not being married. We should be concerned about sexual immorality. We should be concerned about pornography. We should be concerned about um, uh, the sex trade. You know, we should be concerned about these things because it's injustice. Okay, it's injustice and it's immoral. Okay, so we should be concerned about it. Because God is concerned about it. It's that simple. Be concerned about the things that God's concerned about, and don't be concerned about the things that God doesn't care about. That's a good rule of thumb. And just because you think that God uh, cares about something doesn't mean that he actually cares about something. So, uh, we see the day of the Lord mentioned in chapter 4, 10 through 13. I'll talk about this more later. But it's interesting how the day of the Lord was going to include Israel. The day of the Lord was supposed to be a time for them to be delivered from their enemies, but in Amos, he says, no, no, it's going to include you. You're going to be a part of the day of the Lord. So there I gave you some nice little verses there to read through. Uh, very good for just giving a, uh, getting a basic understanding um, of, the, of the book itself. I encourage you to pause the video and read those. Whenever I have the, the scriptures in there, I encourage you to pause it and just read it. A lot of, uh, a lot of good information. And if you have any questions, uh, be sure and leave a comment. So Amos' outline, Israel is no better in, in 1, 2 through 16. Prophecies against Israel in chapter 3 through 6. The uh, five visions in chapter 7 through 9, 10. Um, and promise of restoration in 9, 11 through verse 15. So, you know, he says all this stuff, but then at the end there's still this promise of restoration. I just find that fascinating. Um, so the message was Amos spoke against those who exploited or ignored the needy. Well, I thought he was talking about the religious state. He was. See how he, 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 he equates the two as being, you know, um, being equal there. So uh, Israel had this idea that they were entitled to salvation because they were God's people. They were, you know, uh, exempt from punishment or God wouldn't really do it or wouldn't happen in their days or whatever. They just had this entitlement idea that, you know, they deserve salvation or something. And, and, and we definitely see that that's not true. Um, so that takes us to the prophet Isaiah. Um now, Isaiah um, was the second of the recorded prophets to Israel. And if I remember correctly, he was the last of the recorded prophets to Israel, um, of, of, the, of the major minor prophets. Not necessarily the last prophet ever, but I mean you know, as exclusively to Israel. So, um, uh, this was obviously still during the time of Assyria, since Assyria didn't officially fall until 609. Um, Hosea means the Lord saves. <clears throat> they saw the people at, at one time saw Assyria as a possible ally um, to help them with their foes. But in 5:13 we see Hosea taking a completely different approach. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to King Jerob. But he is unable to heal you or to cure you of your wound. Um, and then 7.11, again, it mentions, uh, So Ephraim has become like a silly dove without sense. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. And uh, basically saying, this is this is dumb. You shouldn't be doing this. Um, so in the time of Hosea, we see uh, economical prosper prosperity, but a religious lack. See, money-wise, the economy was doing great, but religiously, they were doing terrible. 
Now, obviously, some people go to the extreme saying, "Oh, well, that the the flooding that happened in New Orleans that was a that was a sign from God." And and whenever there's any any wrong any bad thing that happens to a nation ever, it's always a sign from God because He's so so wrathful and He hates people so much. Well, I hope that you've learned something from this class. First off, America is not in covenant with the Lord. What does that mean? That means that the promises of the Old Testament do not relate to the nation of America. They relate to the Christians. But even then, it's it's separated by time, and so we have to delve into that message, draw out the principles, and find out what God wants us to learn in a different way time okay jeremiah 29 11 for instance um, we'll talk about that when we get to jeremiah but you know um we are not in, in exile in babylon we are not of the nation of israel we are not under the old covenant so i mean there's so many things that we are not and yet everybody in in the christian church grabs onto a verse that, that means something to them and just quote it and quote it and quote it with while being completely um ignorant of its a act actual meaning and how it applies today so uh, with that, uh, Second Kings fourteen twenty five just gives kind of a gives kind of a time of what was going on. Uh, you can look that up for yourself. Um, but Hosea, Hosea, Hosea was the last king of Israel. Hosea uh, two eight through thirteen uh, talks about um, talks about this for she does not know that it is I who gave her the grain, the new wine, and the oil. So you get God saying I did this for them. They didn't just get it because of how great they are. They did it because I chose to bless them. Listen in 4.1. Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel, for the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land, because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. And he goes on, but you can see um, that the, the people definitely were lacking. Um, so Hosea marries an adulterer. Um, her name is Gomer, a whore or prostitute. Um, and uh, he has kids, and, and it really becomes a symbol for the nation. Um, and in chapter 3, it says, you know, uh, it it's, talks about the second marriage, and it makes it sound like it's someone different than Hosea. Not necessarily. Um, I'm not really going to get into it that much, but um, it says, Okay, then the Lord said to me, Go again, love, a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So, um, so I bought for her... For her, for myself, for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. Now, first off, um, just because he had to buy her does not mean that something didn't happen in between chapter 1 and chapter 3. Maybe, you know, something happened where, where he had to buy her back or something. I mean, it really doesn't give us details and it really doesn't give us a name. It's most likely to be the same woman because that actually affirms the point of the book. That, you know... <laughs> That God is sticking with them, with them, even though they're adultering themselves out. That God is is doing things for their for their benefit. Then He wants them to turn. He's giving them warnings, that kind of things. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, it just kind of seems to fit better. Um, but I mean, I'll I'll let you do your own study and, and find out what, what what you lean towards. But I personally lean towards it still being uh, Gomer. Um, now, be really careful about being being prophetic. You know, sometimes just Pentecostal people in, in the church can get a little bit um, out there into the weird, into the strange. You know, and, oh, I'm a prophet, and God said this. You know, it's like, well, maybe. Maybe that's true, but, eh. you know, you have to be careful. The Bible is the ultimate source of authority, not your prophecy. And, and just be real careful about prophetic utterances against America and whatnot. Well, because, once again... America is not in covenant with with God. Um, the people are certain people. The church is in covenant. Okay, so um, the outline of Hosea then uh, Hosea's family is uh, in God's family it mirrors each other in chapter one through three. God takes Israel to court in chapter four through five. Hosea's invitation tarnished by reality in chapter six through eleven. Eleven God's final arguments against Israel in eleven twelve through three sixteen. So the possibility of restoration is in 14. So if you look, Hosea actually has, excuse me, 14 chapters, whereas Daniel only has 12. Once again, major, minor prophets, it's not like, it's not that simple. So the main message is judgment to come for living in disregard of God and men. Um, just real briefly, I don't want to spend too long on the prophets. Um... I just want to give you a basic overview of when they were when they were written and what the main message is going on. So I, that takes us to Isaiah, which was 
during Isaiah, Assyria. Now, he actually saw the fall of Israel, um, but he was not exclusively to Israel. He, he gave a lot of prophecies for a lot of different people. Um, his audience was Judah and Israel mainly, but he also had prophecies for the surrounding nations. Um, Isaiah means the Lord has saved. Um, if you look in your Bible, he's actually the first of the major prophets in, in, in order there. Um, in, in your Bible, that is. And um, so, so uh, he had two sons. One is something like Belshaw Hashbaz or something like that. I forget what his name is, uh, but uh, oh, I wish I could remember his name. Uh, but uh, <laughs> how would you like that name? Um, and in seven three, it says. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son she Shear Je uh, Jeshub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And then in 8.3, it says, um, Name him Mahar Shalal Hashbash. <laughs> um, so anyways, um, in chapters 1 through 39, Assyria and Isaiah's generation, you know, kind of different feel. But then in chapters 40 through 66, it talks about Babylon, who hasn't even come to power yet. And a lot of the future stuff. Now, but don't take that outline to be to be always accurate. There's a lot of stuff that in the beginning is talking about um, Babylon still in the distant future, but then in the last later section is still talking about you know that. So uh, they the, they break it down like this because a lot of times people have said, well, the, the theme is different in the first 39 chapters and it just completely changes in the last you know uh, 26 chapters. Well, yes, but there's a lot of reasons that could account for that. First off, Isaiah could have been older when he wrote the second half than when he wrote the first half, and our writing styles changed throughout time. Uh, second off, um, the more we grow in the Lord, the more we change, and so we we change in the message that we say. Then also, um, it, the second half could have been written after the fall of Israel, and uh, Isaiah could have had a fresh encounter with the Lord that you know just gave him a, a new insight on, on life and whatnot. And then also, don't forget that just because he he um, he did uh, categorize, well not categorize it, but he did put it in a specific order doesn't mean that it wasn't from the same person. Uh, many times prophecies doesn't do not all, uh, from the same person can be a lot different. You can the same person even today you can give a, a, pro a prophecy of, of judgment, a prophecy of love, a prophecy of encouragement, all these different you know words given. So um, he mentions a suffering servant. Who is a suffering servant? Sometimes it's an individual. Sometimes it's the nation. Sometimes it's the remnant after the exile. Sometimes it's the Messiah. Sometimes it's Isaiah himself. Um, so just once again, pay attention to context. Um, so just I'm going to walk through an, out an outline, and that's all we're really going to do for Isaiah. Uh, and chapter one is the opening words. Chapter two through five is God's judgment revealed. Uh, it mentions the branch of David's line. Um, once again, uh, talking about that promise. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adoration of the survivors of Israel. So once again, about the, um, um, the, the about David's descendants being the branch. So Isaiah's call is recorded in chapter 6. Why didn't he start off the book with, with his call? I have no idea. Um, Chapter six, one through eight, but he has these coals touch on his on his lips, um, and it's interesting to note that that he says, "I I am unclean, and I'm in a people of unclean lips." Not, you know, that everybody around me is evil. He saw God and he realized, you know, his state. Um, but I do want to say this: that after the coal touched touched him, he said it, it. It was said of him that he that he was able to go. He, he was he was clean now. Um, you know, a lot of times in, in the church, even we go off, we go off on these tangents about you know, yes, the Bible does say that everyone has sinned and is and is um, worthy of death, basically. Um, but it also does say that we are standing not on our righteousness, but on God's righteousness through Christ. Therefore, don't call something unclean that is actually clean. Um, in other words, what I'm saying. Um, if you've been made righteous by the blood of Christ, it doesn't matter who you are, or what you're like. It's blood. It's Christ's blood that that, that, that makes you righteous. Um, now, obviously, I'm not condoning, you know, going out and living however you want. But the Bible already talks about that, so I'm not going to waste time. This is a class on the Old Testament. Um, 
So the sign of the manual is talked about in 7, 1 through 17. Um, it, this was an event where Israel and, and Syria were opposing Assyria, and um, they they kind of tried to pull Judah into it. Um, and, and, you know, uh, it, Isaiah gives this prophecy for the king of Judah to kind of give him hope or whatever, but he ends up not trusting in the Lord anyways. Um, and so... Um, So that takes us to, I mean, those references there are, are, are where that comes from, saying Kings 16, 7 through 8, and, and, and Isaiah 7, 1 through 2. The coming Assyrian invasion, 7, 18 through 8, 22. The description of the, of the Messianic age, or era, in 9, 1 through 7. Um, Zebulun and Naphtali mentions that in 9, 1 through 2. Uh, a good deal of Jesus' ministry was, said, was there. So it talks about Zebulun and Naphtali getting the light, where that's where Jesus' ministry was. Um, judgment against Israel and Assyria in 9, 8 um, uh, through um, 10, 34. Uh, pardon that mess up there. Uh, chapter 9, verse 8, not inches, <laughs> uh, to 10, 34. A further description of the Messianic era in, in chapters 11 and 12. Um, once again, David's throne, the line of Jesse, these are all referenced there. Uh, you see that as a main theme. The, the guys were constantly talking about this, pro this uh, promise, and you see it fulfilled in the beginning of Matthew when Jesus is, Jesus is born. So then that takes us to the oracles against the nations in chapter 13 all the way through chapter 23. Um, and Babylon is mentioned, which they weren't even a threat at the time in, chap in chapter 13, 1. Um, the oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. Um, and Moab, I mentioned this, he was from Lot, mentions that in chapter 15. Um, <clears throat> Damascus, Assyria, or Aram, um, they were very powerful. In chapter 17, verse 1, it uh, talks about, or starts talking about that, that I should say. Um, uh, Cush is down in Ethiopia, south of Egypt, and it mentions them in 18. Elam is past Mesopotamia, past the mountains, the Zagros Mountains that I was showing you in, in the introduction lesson, so further east. Um, Media is all is north of Elam, so think of it as Elam's far east over the mountains, and Media is just, you know, northwestish of there. Um, okay, Tyre and Sidon, I mentioned that they were on the coast. Uh, great traders, it's called the Phoenicians, a very powerful, very wealthy. Um, if you needed any kind of, you know, sea export or anything they were the people to go to in fact Solomon did go to them uh, they're mentioned in chapter 23 uh, 1 through 2 for instance um, and uh, yeah so this is just a map real quickly uh, to show the different places you can see media sorry there right there Elam's over here here's the Zagros mountains that I was talking about um, oh I'm sorry Elam's over here uh, I could have sworn it was over here I, sorry about that um, so Elam's here, Mesopotamia plain here, Assyria, uh, Babylon is over here. Here's Egypt, Cush, and them. That's all down here, um, kind of way far down. Um, and yeah, they're the different peoples. Um, so that uh, that takes us to the little apocalypse. But um, I'm kind of running long on this video, so we're gonna stop it there, and I'll pick up on the rest of Isaiah in the next lesson. Okay. Thanks for watching.